Today we're going to talk about sets. What is a set? Sets. A set is a collection of objects. A set is a collection Objects. So it's really, that's all. It's just a collection of objects. Here's some notation for it. The objects inside a given set are called elements of the set. And we write that as A is an element of a set S. So that means A is an element of S. <coughs> So if it's not an element of S, then we put a line through our little element sign. A is not an element of S. And we might want to know how many things are in our set. So we have a piece of notation for that as well, where we put we put kind of fences around our S, which usually in maths means the size of something if it's finite. So S is the number of elements, the number of elements in S. So here are some examples of some sets that you probably you've probably met before. There's the set N of natural numbers, which we usually write in what's called blackboard bold, which is an N with an extra little line down it. The reason it's called blackboard bold is because you can't really write bold on a blackboard. You'd have to kind of colour it in like that, which is a bit boring, takes a long time, so we write it like that. That was a very irrelevant aside. So N is the set of natural numbers. <coughs> so the natural numbers are things like 1, 2, 3, and so on. This is actually a formal piece of mathematical notation. It's important when you're doing mathematics properly to use the proper mathematical notation. So if these are three dots. Uh, <coughs> oh dear, I'm going to die of a coughing pit. I once had a maths lecturer who said diddly dot every time he wrote three dots on the board. I will not do that. Um, Another set of things that you've met before and which we're going to be spending quite a lot of time looking at is the set of integers, which you might think it's a bit mysterious that it's written with a Z, but that's because it's for the German. Um, the German for number is Zahl. If we wrote I, it would get really confusing, see. Um, so the integers are zero, plus or minus one, plus or minus 2, and so on. Then uh, another thing that we can have is the rational numbers. And that's a Q for quotient. because we want to save the letter R for something else. And the rational numbers are things that can be expressed as an integer divided by another integer. So these are things of the form A divided by B, where A and B are integers. And of course, B is not allowed to be zero. Now here's another piece of formal mathematical notation I've just introduced. This straight line here, means such that. So when we're writing, it means such that. So when we're saying what a set is, we often say it's some stuff such that. Well, what does that stuff mean? So this is A over B such that A and B are integers and B is not equal to zero. We've also got the set blackboard bold R, that's why we couldn't call the quotient the, the rational numbers are, and that's the real numbers. So that includes the irrational numbers as well. 
things that can't be written as fractions in this way, like the square root of 2, e, pi, and lots of other things. Of course, these are very, very large sets. In fact, they're infinite sets. There are some much smaller sets that are also important. I wonder if you can see at the bottom of the board. Yeah, I think you can. There's also the empty set. The empty set. The empty set, which is empty. It has no elements at all. So sometimes people write it with as the curly brackets with absolutely nothing inside it. The empty set is quite odd. I mean, you can't see it. How many different empty sets are there in the world? That's quite an odd question to ask. These are the sorts of things that, that philosophers, philosophers, can't say it, philosophers of mathematics get quite excited about. You know, what, what is the empty set? How many empty sets are there? Um, but there are also some much more straightforward sets, such as, um, I'll just squeeze it in at the bottom there. We could have x equals some random collection of numbers 1, 2, 9. is a perfectly good set that has three elements in it. So a set is a collection of objects. It doesn't have to be a sensible collection of objects. It can be a completely random collection of objects. It could be, for example, the collection egg, house, balloon. That's a set. It's not a very useful set, not for us anyway. It's not a very mathematically stated set, but it's still a set. So it's tempting to think that sets are things that you can define in some sort of sensible way like this, but that's not necessarily the case. Now, I should warn you at this point that this isn't this isn't what this isn't the end of the story about the definition of set. It will do for us now, but you can very quickly get yourself tangled up if you just really say that a set is nothing but a collection of objects. Because you can you can find yourself running into the following paradox. Let's say that M let me find some space on the board. Let's M be the set containing all those sets that are not members of themselves. Be the set of every set that is not a member of itself. So then the question is, is M a member of itself? So M is the set containing every set that is not a member of itself. Is M a member of itself? So is M a member of this set? Well. The things in here are precisely those things not a member of itself. So it can only be in here if it's not a member of itself. But if it's in there, then it is a member of itself, because it this is M. So if it is a member of itself, that means it isn't a member of itself. But if it isn't a member of itself, then it is a member of itself. Ah! What's going on? This is called Russell's paradox. The way that mathematicians have decided to get around Russell's paradox is just to say, this situation is not allowed, we're not going to deal with it. If you study advanced set theory, you'll find out how to say that more precisely, but I'm not going to worry about it for now. This definition will be enough for us, and we'll talk about it some more in the next video.